Okay. Good morning, GCEF PO family. I've met our family at York and Halton, and now I'm meeting the GCEF PO family. And I got a lot of names today, and I might need a reminder. But I hope to uh, minister today and get to know you guys better as the Lord permits. It is a privilege to be here, and I was asked as Neri and and um, was busy to come here today to minister to you from John 9. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. And as we just read, we're going to look at John 9, 1 to 12. But we're going to read it out of the the version that I studied that was the KJV version. And as we read it, there is a slight, just a few words, differences, but I'll point them out so that we know, so that we can be on the same page. But as we read from the very beginning, and Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind, from his birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, according to Jewish custom, we know, and even still some Eastern nations, even to this day, they believed, some people, that all miscarriages Deformities and mishaps were linked to some family generational curse from one's sins or their father's sins. As we can see here, this mindset was that of the disciples themselves. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, in one sense, we could say that this is both true and false. In what sense this is true, we must see that, one, our original sin makes us liable to all human miseries and death. Our original sin that we inherit from Adam and Eve and is passed down from them all the way to us to the last human, makes us liable of all human miseries. That's why we are sick. That's why accidents happen. And ultimately, that is why death. Two, we may see that from our fathers to the third and fourth generations, some do suffer a curse, as we read of it in the Ten Commandments. Three, We also read in Galatians that every man shall reap what he sows. Now in these three senses, we can see how it is true how sins can be either passed down or from our own actions. But what we're looking at here, as Jesus replies in verse 3, Jesus answered and he said, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now as we consider this, neither this man nor his parents, we know that only one person lived a sinless life, that is our Lord Jesus Christ. But what Jesus is showing his disciples is that they were trying to trace back to some root cause as why this man must have been born blind. He must have been a great sinner or his parents must have done some great sin for this sad case to happen to him. But in this context, though all of those three points before could have been true, Jesus gives us the definite answer and the main reason for this elect child of God being born blind. And it's to allow for the powerful work of God to cure him and ultimately to glorify God. 
Now, before we move on, we're looking at the context of the scripture itself, and then we're seeing the, con the relevance in our context. In the introduction, we must understand, before we continue throughout these uh, verses, that we all are born blind. This man was blind from his birth. You and me are blind from our birth. This man, as we're going to read later on, he sat and he begged. He was completely helpless. A blind man couldn't go out and work a normal job. What did he live off of? Alms. He lived off of the goodwill of the people. He lived off of charity. And so you and me, if we think about it, we are not working for our life and for the good things we do. But everything we have is, as it were, by grace and mercy, which is the alms of God. This man... As all of God's elect children are born blind, but what is the reason for it? So that the works of God should be made manifest in them. You and me and every single true Christian glorifies God because God's works is made manifest in us in a greater sense than we see in Genesis 1 when God created the heavens and the earth and he spoke everything into existence. The world and all creation that we see, the beautiful, vast creation, God created with his word. And he upholds it, as Paul says, by the word of his power. But you and me, who are Christians, who are new creatures in Christ Jesus, he didn't just make us with his word, but he saved us with his own son's blood. We are here to manifest the works of God, to shine the light of God in this world. You and me, and every saved sinner, we could say, is a greater miracle than creation. Creation took the words of God. Our salvation took the life of God's only begotten Son. And by that you can see how much greater care God has for us. Jesus says, it's that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And in verse 4, and in verse 4, we read this. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. In these two verses, I want to look at now Jesus' as it were, how he was compelled to obey the Father. Previously in John chapter 4, we see Jesus speaking at the woman at the well, and he says, he says to his disciples, it is my meat to do the will of my Father in heaven. In this verse, he says, I must work the works of him that sent me. And every Christian who has the Holy Spirit and knows the love of God because the love of God is shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost, they must obey God. They must serve God because the love of God, as Paul says, the love of Christ constraineth us. The love of God and the fear of God so persuades and so constrains us that we see I must serve God. It is the least I could do for what he has done for me. Jesus says, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. We're seeing here now the contrast between day and night. The day and the night are known by the presence and the absence of light. Just like something that is hot and cold, we learn in school that 
cold is just the absence of heat. Night, or darkness, is the absence of light. The light, in this context, is the Word of God. The Word of God incarnate, or the Word made flesh, and the Word of God in print that we're reading right now. This lamp and light unto our feet and path is not just for everyone's singular individual use, but can also be as a light upon a hill and upon a housetop as it is now through the preaching of the word. When we read the word and we seek to obey the word, it is a light and a lamp unto our feet, individually how you and I live our lives. But when the word is preached and proclaimed, then it is like a light on a housetop to lighten the way of a multitude. Jesus shows us here, though, what this light and darkness means. If I could just read in chapter 11, verse 9, Jesus says this. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. And we could say, as it were, that all people fall into either one or two of these categories. They are walking in light or they are walking in darkness. Those that walk in the light are those that have the light of the word of God in them. It's a light unto their path and a lamp unto their feet. And it shows them the way in which they should go. But take away the light. No man can work. When you take away the light, Jesus says, while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. In the nighttime, we are made to sleep and to rest, and in the daytime, to work and to labor. In the night, I might not be able to see five feet in front of me. I cannot see if there's a ditch there. I cannot see if there are predators around me. I will see it when it's too late. In the daytime, I could see maybe a hundred kilometers off. But this light and, and, and night or darkness is showing us, once again, as the proverb says in chapter 4, it is showing us two kinds of people and two kinds of lives. It says in Proverbs 4, 18 and 19, but the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. But the way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Jesus is the light of this world. And as long as we have Jesus, and as long as we have the word of God, which is the will of God, then we have light of how we are to live and lead our lives. But this shows us something else. Jesus says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And as long as Christ is in the world, either in the flesh as then, or in the spirit through his word and his church as now, there is hope for the world. But how hopeless are those masses of millions in the world still without a Bible or a church or a Christian to show them the light of the world? And this is the most needful and necessary ingredient we could say to each and every missionary. It is a love for the loss. It is a love for the loss and it is a realizing that there are still millions of people in the world to this day with no light. And if with no light, then with no hope. 
And Jesus gives us the keys, but he also gives us the responsibility and the great commission to go. And if we, as we read of here, and as we read of elsewhere in the Bible, if we see that we have not only the greatest privileges in the world, being the children of God, but the greatest responsibility of the world, being the servants and stewards of the mysteries of God, then that ought to make us, as it says in Psalm 2, rejoice with trembling. That ought to make us, as it made Paul, what did he say? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And that ought to make us the most humble and thankful of people, but also the most obliged of people to serve God. Our privileges is what should make us want to serve God all the more. I'm not serving God so that he could love me at the end. We are serving God because he loves us. While we were yet sinners, he loved us, and he gave his son to die for us. And so therefore, we're seeing that we have the light, but yet we are stewards of this light, and we have a command to go out into the world. We have a command to let our light so shine, and we have a command to not just keep and bury our talent, but to multiply it with others. Therefore, as long as Christ is in the world, he is the light of the world. And where Christ is preached, there is light. There is light in this church, in this building, as long as Christ is preached. But if we get on a plane and go somewhere else to North Korea or Russia or China, if there's no Christ, there's no light. And if there's no light, men stumble over Satan's snares, over the devices of the evil one, over this world's distractions, and over their own deceitful hearts. But what we're seeing is this. As we move on to verses now 6 and 7, Jesus says, and when he had spoken thus, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Now, out of every place in the scripture, we may see that this is one of the strangest ways of Jesus curing a man, spitting on the ground and pretty much grabbing a handful of dirt and spit, making clay, and then anointing this man's eyes, pretty much wiping it on his eyes. Now this word anointing is not here by accident because it's showing us that it is a holy act. Why? Because the spit, which is something that is naturally averse and disgusting to us, is holy because it comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we're seeing here is not to get stuck on the means of what Jesus chooses to use because we must always remember that God is sovereign. <clears throat> and he could use any means he pleases. He could use spit if he pleases. He could use a donkey if he pleases. He could use a rooster if he pleases. He used a donkey to reprove Balaam. He used a rooster to open the eyes of Peter. He could use any means he wants. God is completely sovereign and he is completely independent to do whatever he pleases. We are not here to get stuck on the means that God chose to use. 
But the main purpose of what Jesus did to this blind man was to prove and to test his faith and to see if he believed or if he was just going to go away as Naaman almost did. Now we see a similar case here in 2 Kings 5, 10 to 14. If you guys remember Naaman, who was the leper. 2 Kings 5, 10 to 14, which I'll read to you right here really quick, and we'll see Naaman. Naaman went to Elisha. Naaman was a leper, a great man, but a leper. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth. That means Naaman was angry and went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hands over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the rivers, of the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child and he was clean. Jesus could have just said, your faith has made thee whole, go in peace. He did that for others. But when Jesus tells us to do something in order to get something, what he's doing is testing our faith if we believe him. This man was to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Uh, Naaman was to dip himself seven times. We are to read and to pray and to get baptized. What we're seeing here is this. That our obedience is a reflection of our faith to the amount that we believe is the amount that we will obey. It was a saying of St. Augustine that no man practices more than he believes. And we practice what we believe. Each and every single one of us are reading and praying, and seeking, and asking, and knocking as much as we believe God will give us. But with the increase of faith will come always the increase of devotion, the increase of sacrifice, and the increase of obedience. Now this can seem, in a sense, as salvation by works which we do not teach. A man is justified by faith alone, not of works. But what we're seeing is this. When Jesus says, and when Paul says, and when the New Testament says Christ will come, he will judge every man according to his works that he has done in the flesh, whether it be good or whether it be bad. God is judging us according to our works, not because they save us, but because they prove us. Our works prove our faith. Hence, that's how we reconcile Paul and James. Paul will say that faithful Abraham was justified by faith. James says it was by works. But why did Abraham go and offer Isaac? Because he believed that God was even able to raise him from the dead. And so therefore, he obeyed. Jesus sent this man 
just as he sends us. And our response is according to our faith. Now, what we're seeing here, though, in verse 7, it says, He went his way, therefore, and washed, and he came seeing. He went, he washed, he came. He went the Lord's way, he washed in obedience, and he came again a new man. Such is the life and work and effect of faith. Here, in a verse we can see, is the whole Christian life. He went, he washed, he came. We went or we go in the Lord's way with whatever he commands us. We wash ourselves in obedience. And then we come again as new creatures. That is every Christian's life. In this story, and in every other story, Jesus is teaching us something personal and not just about what happened to this individual. You and me were blind. You and me were like the woman who had the issue of blood, dying. And it says she spent her money on everything and on our physicians, and she grew worse. You and me were like those ten lepers that came to Jesus Christ. And we were like dead Lazarus, wrapped in grave clothes. But in every single sick and diseased person, as Jesus heals them and cures them, he is showing us a spiritual leprosy and a spiritual blindness and a spiritual death that he recovered us from. If we see it this way, that we can sing with John Newton, I once was blind, but now I see. Verse 8 to 12, in conclusion. He sees now, and the neighbors therefore, and they which were before, had seen him that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam, and wash, and I went and washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. In verse 8 and 9, what we're seeing is this, is that they inquired if this was he that was blind, but now sees. That was a helpless beggar, but now a new man. And so it should be with us. Before we know God, and after that we have become enlightened with the light of truth. This people saw a radical change. A blind man begging, to now a man walking and seeing, and he has his life back. He could go and do whatever he wants now. So it should be with us. A Christian is one, as Paul says, who had the spirit of disobedience and was a child of wrath and was darkened in his mind to being enlightened, to being renewed, to being regenerated, to old things passing away, and behold, all things are become new in Christ Jesus. We have the greatest change happen to us when we are born again and is continually happening to us throughout our life through sanctification. And what the point is here is this, is that not that this man went to the people, but that the people went to him. It's not that this man went to the people and told them, look, my eyes, but is that the people observed 
you can see now. So it should be with us. Because when we're enlightened, not with our physical sight, but with our spiritual sight, we see now things as God sees. What you see in the world, on TV, on movies, and and their perspective, what we're seeing is how the world sees things. When we open this book and read the Bible, we're seeing how does God see things. That's what the world says. This is what God says. Whose perspective are we going to trust and live by? But the difference that it should make in our lives should be radical. We were once on the broad path to destruction, and now we're on the narrow to life. We were once slaves to sin, and now we become slaves to righteousness, as Romans 6 says. We were once at enmity against God, but now we put down all the weapons of war, and we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Everything that we see now, how we think, and therefore how we live, should be radically changed because we were once blind, but now we see. We were once lost, but now we are found. What we're seeing here is that as he rehearses his testimony to his neighbors of how he was made whole, we see what should be the effect in our testimonies after we have received sight through our regeneration and the renewing of our mind. They ask, is this the same man? Then how can it be? And where is he that did this for you? So it should be with us. After people see our change and conversion, they should not recognize us for having been made new creatures in Christ Jesus. They should say to us, as they said to this man, how do you see? How are you new? Who restored you? Because we too are made new creatures in Christ. Then they should ask us, how do we become so? Then we reply with what we did practically. We prayed, we read, we went to church, we were asking, we were seeking, we were knocking, just as Cornelius the centurion did. And in accordance with the will of God. And what happens? We can say that God fulfilled his promises in our lives because none of our seeking was in vain, and he casts out none that come unto him. Our lives is proving God's word. And as all of our seeking, all of our asking, all of our knocking, and all of our using of the means of grace, what we're showing is this, is that God answers prayers, is that God is in his word. He will reveal himself to you. And then after this man tells them what Jesus did for him, they said unto him, where is he? And that's how it should end with us. Our testimony should not end with us, but it should end with our Savior, and it should end where they could find him as well. I'd like to conclude with Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 9. And what we're seeing is the same thing in the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 9, says this. When the daughters of Jerusalem asked the Shulamite... They ask, What is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women, what is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? 
So they're asking the Shulamite the same thing that this man's neighbors asked him. And she replies with this, My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. His head is as most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices and sweet flowers. His lips are like lilies, dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with the beryl. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. And then what do they reply? Whither is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Whither is thy beloved turned aside, that we may seek him with thee? My beloved has gone down into his garden, to the bed of spices, to feed in the gardens, and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. Where does Christ to be found? He's to be found in his church. He's to be found in his house. He's to be found in his word. He's to be found in the sacraments, the body and the blood that we, we, we break and we drink. He's to be found in baptism. He's to be found in his ordinances. He's to be found in his creation. But what we're seeing here is this, as we read that long description of the Shulamite describing her beloved which is just spiritually speaking, the church describing Christ, her bridegroom. What we're seeing here, brethren, is this. Every single detail of his face, of his body. She is describing the detail between two married lovers and spouses something that only your spouse knows about you and nobody else in the world. But he's showing us the kind of intimacy that Christ has with his church. If I'm with you right now and we're in a, a football field and you're at the other end zone, if I see you, I just see a figure. I don't see any details. I can't recognize you. But as you and I walk closer and closer together, I see more details. I recognize who you are. And then eventually, I can say, that is my beloved. And that's the kind of relationship that God wants to have with us. Not at a distance where we vaguely see God and we, we see God just broadly. We see God uh, through a glass darkly but more and more intimate does God want to be with us and we should want to be with God. James says, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. And then, once we describe God, once we show through our lives what God has done for us, Then the world outside. They should be so taken up with our beloved that they say, Where is your beloved gone? O thou fairest among women. And where is he turned aside that we may seek him also? And that's our evangelism. Our great love for Christ. Our thankfulness to Christ. And our relationship with God Almighty. And as we do this, through our words and through our actions, we too will shine our lights that men may glorify 
by seeking and worshiping our Father in heaven. Let us bow our heads and pray. Our good and holy and gracious God and Father, hallowed be thy name. Lord, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We are unworthy. We have all sinned and come short of thy glory. But, oh God, you loved us still. Lord, we thank you for giving us sight. We thank you for seeking and finding us. And we thank you for dying on the cross to save us. Help us, O oh Lord, now to so live our lives as a testimony to this lost and darkened world with what great things the Lord has done for us. O oh Lord, shine your light in and through us to this world. And help us, O oh Lord, to all be wise and faithful servants and obedient children. For this is our greatest privilege and greatest responsibility. We thank thee, O Lord, for all things. We pray bless the rest of our worship time. We pray, O Lord, bless the worship of all the GCF churches. And we pray, O Lord, bless the worship of all your churches worldwide. Be with thy people, O Lord. And each and every day, each and every quiet time, each and every prayer and devotion and sermon, draw us nearer. And we know that you will draw near to us. We thank you and pray this with the forgiveness of our many sins. In Jesus' name do we pray. Amen.